Okay, good morning. Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, you all understood, uh, here are my disclosures, sorry. Uh, you all understood what is the management of acute ischemic stroke. You have sudden neurological symptoms. You will do CT or MR, and you have to eliminate uh, stroke mimics. You will have the diagnosis of stroke. You have to differentiate between hemorrhage or ischemic lesion, and you have to make a choice for the treatment, which is should the patients be treated with IV thrombolysis is there an indication for IA treatment, endovascular treatment? And finally, we will discuss rapidly prevention. Don't forget that IV thrombolysis can be performed in the time window of 4.5 hours, which is relatively short indeed. And you have, we have to have a very short uh, decision-making process to be able to uh, get a higher number of patients having IV thrombolysis. Imaging of acute ischemic stroke, what we need? We need to exclude stroke mimics, to exclude hematoma, to show the ischemic lesion, to characterize the ischemic lesion, where is the occlusion site, to differentiate score on penumbra, to uh, determine the age of uh, uh, the stroke lesion, singularly in wake-up stroke, and also to analyze collateral circulation, and we have also to evaluate cerebral parenchyma to know if there is some uh, leukoriosis or microblitz. Acute ischemic stroke, should you, we use CT or MR? It's difficult to answer. We have seen that for stroke mimics, MR is probably better. For uh, uh, visualization of the ischemic lesion, also MR is better. For penumbra, there is still a debate. For wake-up stroke, we will see that MR is providing some interesting information. And finally, for the analysis of cerebral parenchyma, uh, probably MR is also better. So the MRI protocol you have to use for the imaging of acute ischemic stroke is this protocol, uh, use of diffusion imaging to depict recent lesions, use of flare to analyze white matter and to depict all lesions. A T2 star will show you MRH, MRA will show you the occlusive lesion, and finally perfusion will help you to analyze this penumbra. Imaging and selection of patients candidates for IV thrombolysis. How can we help with imaging to select the patient for IV thrombolysis? We have to try to identify the salvageable brain. We have to determine the initial size of the ischemic lesions, and we will use for this purpose the aspect score. We have to evaluate the clot, clot location, clot length, clot burden. Also, we will say a word regarding wake-up stroke, and finally, we will say a word also regarding evaluation of parenchyma. Salvageable brain, infarct core and penumbra, as was well said by Paul Parizel, core is irreversibly injured tissue that cannot be salvaged even with tissue reperfusion, and penumbra is tissue at risk of infarction but salvageable with early restoration of blood flow. And you see that with the time going, you have an increase of the infract core and you have a decrease of the penumbra. And you see that the time is very short. At three hours, you see that the penumbra is uh, already reduced. And at 12 hours, you still have very few penumbras. Then you have to go very quickly to try to save parenchyma with penumbra. Okay, how to evaluate this penumbra? You can use, as, we, as was uh, already shown, uh, the mismatch, uh, diffusion, uh, perfusion mismatch. Diffusion is supposed to show uh, ischemic core, and uh, perfusion will show you the hypoperfused tissue, and by using the mismatch diffusion perfusion, you will obtain the penumbra. Here you have the perfusion imaging. You see this hypoperfused eye area. You see the, is the diffusion lesion, uh, uh, which is relatively limited. And by using this mismatch diffusion perfusion, you detect the penumbra, which is this region. In fact, as was said by Paul, it's not so simple. Probably diffusion lesion is not exactly the infarct core. And the diffusion lesion can partially regress uh, after the treatment. 
Also, perfusion is not so simple. MRI perfusion, we have to determine which parameter has to be used, MTT, TTP, CBF, CBV, Tmax, which value is the most appropriate one. And actually, the current consensus is for uh, uh, perfusion MRI to use Tmax with a value of six seconds. Also, the ratio between hypoperfused tissue and ischemic core is not well known. If we look at the recent trials regarding IV thrombolysis, we see that the ratio between hypoperfused tissue and ischemic core was in diffuse and epithet trials 1.2, and in the most recent diffuse 2 uh, trial, the ratio was uh, 1.8. Also, one important question is, can, can mismatch be automatically calculated using software? We have several softwares that were evaluated in the literature. Singularly, RAPID was a software that was used in a lot of uh, clinical trials for IV thrombolysis. But uh, to my knowledge, they are not completely validated, but we need them because we need to go very quickly to make a decision, and probably we need software that are able to give us uh, the mismatch very rapidly. All recent IV thrombolysis, and I have listed some of them here, were using or analyzing the value of mismatch in the conduct, the, 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 the use of uh, IV thrombolysis, and probably is a very important uh, uh, tool in the management of acute ischemic stroke. Another point is evaluation of lesion size. You can evaluate the lesion size with aspect score. It was initially uh, developed for CT imaging, but it was also now available for MRI. You see that you have uh, the, the definition of areas in the anterior circulation, and uh, the, the score is 10 minus the number of areas with ischemic lesion you will lose one point per area uh, with ischemic lesion and you will have a final, final aspect score. Also, aspect score is now available for posterior circulation lesion. Just to show you an example here, uh, diffusion, flare, and uh, T2 star, you see right hemiplegia with a delay of two hours, 20 minutes. You have here the lesion in diffusion, and if you look at the aspect uh, scale, you can calculate that here you have a lesion in the caudate, in the lenticular nucleus, and in the insula, and the aspect score is seven here. Another example here, uh, uh, right hemiplegia with a delay of two hours, 50 minutes, and you see, the, again, the aspect uh, uh, scale, and you can use it to determine that five areas have an ischemic lesion, and finally, the aspect score is 10 minus 5, then 5. Aspect score is uh, related to outcome, and it's very important. I, I have this information from the samurai registry conducted indeed in Japan, and you see that if aspect score is greater or equal to seven, it is related to good clinical outcome with a relatively low odds ratio, but still 1.8. But most important, aspect score is related to death. Aspect less or equal to 4 is related to death with a very high odds ratio, 3.6. And also, aspect score less or equal uh, to 5 is related to symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage with a high odds ratio. So aspect score is important to predict the clinical outcome. So we have probably to calculate aspect score when we are doing a CT or MR for uh, acute ischemic stroke. Clot location is also important. We can use two MRA techniques, 3D TOF, which will show you the occlusion of the M1 segment here, or also contrast enhanced MRA. Contrast enhanced MRA has a big value because it will also permit you to analyze the cervical vessels and also to analyze the distal circulation, distal to the clot. So for this reason, probably contrast MRA is more interesting compared to 3D TOF. Just to show you here some examples, 3D TOF showing a, a MCA 
occlusion compared to DSA angiography. Here again, 3D TOF showing occlusion of carotid artery on M1 segment, and it's uh, clearly uh, correlated with the DSA. Now here, example of contrast enhanced MRA, you see that we clearly see here the occlusion of M1 segment, and we are able to analyze the carotid bifurcation. Here you see this uh, occlusion of the basilar artery, the the tip of the basilar artery with some abnormality here of the right vertebral artery, and here you see clearly this occlusion of the uh, cervical and the tracranial uh, and tra uh, internal carotid artery. And what is important is that it was shown in a relatively old paper is that recanalization after IV thrombolysis is clearly correlated to the occlusion site. You see that if you have an occlusion of ICA, the rate of recanalization is just 8%. If it's a main trunk of middle cerebral artery, the rate of recanalization is 24%. If the occlusion is at the level of FC MCA bifurcation, the rate or free opening is 35%, and if it's a MCA branch, the rate of recanalization is 40%. So the so occlusion side is also important to have an idea of the efficacy of IV thrombolysis. Clot length, clot length is also an important information. You can measure it on MRA, singularly contrast enhanced MRA. You see uh, it's a contrast enhanced MRA showing this occlusion of the middle cerebral artery. As you can uh, perfectly analyze the distal territory of MCA distal to the clot, you can measure the clot on the contrast enhanced MRA. You can also use T2 star, and it was shown by Olivier Nagara in a recent paper. You can use on T2 stars this susceptibility vessel sign. Susceptibility vessel sign means that you can see the clot in the vessel as a very uh, uh, hyposignal area in the vessel with a small, uh, with a relative uh, enlargement of the vessel. And you can measure, by measuring this susceptibility vessel sign, you can know the length of the clot. And clot length is also important to know if IV thrombolysis will be efficacious or not. And you see that in this paper of Friedel et al. in stroke in 2011, with a clot greater than 8 mm, IV RTPA is no more efficacious. Derived from this idea of clot length, we have the clot burden score, which, can be, which was initially developed with CT angiography and can be used also with T2 star. I, I cannot go in details with that, but you see that if your uh, clot burden score is greater than six, it is significantly associated with a high rate of 24-hour recanalization on three months favorable outcomes. So again, it's important to have this uh, clot burden score. Wake-up stroke, it's uh, very difficult, and you know that a lot of strokes are, di are diagnosed uh, uh, when the patient wakes up, at, uh, up, and we have, and at, in this situation, you don't know the delay from symptom onset to treatment. So you can use what we call, probably not appropriately, diffusion flare mismatch. It's, it means diffusion is positive and flare is negative. You see that in 88 of patients with flare negative, stroke is less than 4.5 hours. So it means that if you have this diffusion flare mismatch, you can probably do IV thrombolysis, but 44% of patients with stroke less than 4.5 hours have no mismatch. It means that flare is, can be positive before 4.5 hours indeed. Evaluation of brain parenchyma, you see that you can depict leukoaryosis, and leukoaryosis is associated with increase of hemorrhage, but leukoaryosis is not a contraindication to IV thrombolysis, and also microblades can be analyzed with uh, MRI. And you see that you see these microblades here, and you see that the rate of uh, spontaneous uh, symptomatic uh, intracranial hemorrhage is increased when you have microblades, 7.4 percent compared to 4.4 percent when you have no microblades. But microblades is not a contraindication to stroke uh, to IV thrombolysis. IV thrombolysis was introduced after. Uh, any, ID, any NDS RTPA trial showing a favorable outcome after RTPA in the uh, time window three hours compared to placebo, 39% of favorable outcome compared to 26% in the placebo group. 
These results were further confined by uh, several air cities and pooled air cities showing independent, uh, good clinical outcome in 49% and also in the sixth most registry with 40, uh, 54% of good, out, good clinical outcome. But IV thrombolysis at a lot of limits. Time window is 4.5 hours. There are a lot of contraindications to treatment, recent surgery, anticoagulation. Also, there is a low recanalization rate in major, major trunk occlusions, as we have seen before. Also, recanalization rate, you see that recanalization rate with IV is 43%. Recanalization with IA treatment is 63%, whatever the kind of IA treatment. And with mechanical uh, endovascular treatment, the rate of recanalization is still higher, uh, 83%. So endovascular treatment of acute ischemic stroke was developed in several steps. Chemical thrombolysis at the beginning, which was injection of a thrombolytic agent in the occluded vessel. The next step was mechanical thrombolysis by doing clot fragmentation with, with several techniques. I have no time to go in details. Finally, we are the first generation of device to do clot retrieval with singularly Mercy and Penumbra device followed by the second generation uh, device, which were a stent retrievers, which are able to do an arterial bypass on clot retrieval. And I show you here an example of stent retrievers, which are the device that are actually used for the endovascular of stroke. Just to show you how it works, here you have the clot in the MCA artery. You pass the microcatheter through the clot, and you will deploy the stent because it's a stent in the clot. And by deploying the uh, stent in the clot, you will immediately restore the flow. And also, you will catch the clot in the uh, stent, and you will retrieve the, the stent on the clot in the uh, microcatheter. Just to show you an example here. Uh, uh, early uh, stroke, two hours, 40 minutes after stroke onset, you see limited lesions on uh, diffusion imaging, aspect is six, no lesion on uh, flare on T2 star images. You have on this uh, MRA occlusion of uh, M1 segment, the patient is treated with IV RTPA, but it's not successful, and you still have this occlusion when you do the angiography after IV TPA, and you will treat such, this patient with mechanical thrombectomy using a stent retriever. You will deploy the stent inside the, uh, the clot, and you will immediately restore the flow, and it's the final result with complete reopening of the MCA artery. Yeah, and, and it's a CT 24 hours after the treatment, no hemorrhagic transformation, limited ischemic lesion, and it's a MRI at three months showing very limited ischemic lesion and good clinical outcome. Another example here, limited lesion in the pons with occlusion of the basilar artery, and uh, again, you see that here you have this occlusion of the basilar artery and angiography. Treatment will be performed using uh, the stent driver, and you will obtain a complete reopening of this artery. And the, comp and the final result is limited lesion and in the pons with improvement of the clinical status. MRI shows you the cause of this uh, ischemic lesion, which is a dissection of the vertebral artery. And MRI at three months show you very limited pons lesion on good clinical outcome again. There was a trial comparing second generation device to first generation device showing the superiority of stent retrievers. And you see here that the good clinical outcome was more frequent with second generation device, 58% of cases compared to 33% of cases with Mercy. And also the rate of recanalization with second generation device was higher. But Endovascular treatment was evaluated in three air cities published in 2030s, IMS3, Synthesis Expansion, and MR Rescue, and these three air cities comparing endovascular treatment on IV treatment were negative, but had a lot of limitations. Here I will just discuss IMS3 results. 
there are no significant difference between IV and endovascular treatment groups. You see here, good clinical outcome was obtained in 38% of cases with IV treatment and 40% of cases with endovascular treatment. If you look at severe stroke, clinical outcome is better after endovascular treatment than after IV treatment, but not significantly. You see that good clinical outcome in severe stroke is obtained in 16% of cases with IV treatment and 23% of cases after endovascular treatment. But in fact, IMS3 has a lot of limits. The first limit is that major arterial occlusion was not part of the selection of the patient. It means that it was not a requirement of the protocol to evaluate with CTA or MRA the presence of a major arterial occlusion, which is the indication for endovascular treatment. And you see that CTA was performed only in 46% of patients. Also, modalities of endovascular treatment were very heterogeneous. You see that there was all techniques, IA, RTPA in 51 patients, use of first generation device in a lot of patients, and use of second generation device only in four patients. So it was uh, the, the, the tools that were used for the endovascular treatment were not really appropriate, in fact, but the study started in 2005, and it is the reason why we have this heterogeneity of modalities of treatment. Also, the delay between uh, on symptom onset on IV was different in the, uh, was uh, higher in, uh, after endovascular, tre for endovascular treatment. You know that, you see that the delay is 2,008 two minutes for endovascular treatment on 120 minutes for IV, and we know that delay is very, very important for the clinical outcome. So it's, uh, see, we have, you, there are other reasons why uh, IMS3 were negative, but there are the three three major reasons. So now what are the current indications with, for mechanical thrombectomy according to these negative studies? Uh, when delay is greater than 4.5 hours, because it's a time window for uh, IV thrombolysis, optimal delay for mechanical thrombectomy is not known. Uh, maybe six hours for anterior circulation, maybe more for uh, posterior circulation. Also, mechanical thrombectomy is indicated in case of contraindication to IV RTPA, in case of failure of IV RTPA when you have a large trunk occlusion, ICA, M1, basilar artery, and maybe when the clot is greater than 8 millimeter. Prevention of stroke rapidly because it's not so good. Place of endovascular treatment, we have two techniques that can be used, carotid stenting. Here I show you an example. It's a uh, tight stenosis of the origin of the ICA treatment with stenting and very good anatomical results. And also another technique is intracranial stenting with ESC stenosis treatment with the placement of a stent and finally a very good anatomical results. But there were a lot of uh, RCTs, randomized control trial, comparing carotid stenting on antarterectomy, evas 3 space, ICSS, and so on. You see that the pool data shows that any stroke or death after carotid stenting is 8.9% higher than after uh, antarterectomy, which is just 5.8%. Interestingly, uh, when the patient is less than 70 years old, you see that the rate of any stroke or death is similar with stenting on endarterectomy, but when the patient is older than 70, you see that the rate of stroke is uh, very higher compared with uh, stenting compared to endarterectomy. So after this uh, randomized control trial... There's one, there's one minute left. Yeah, please. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, symptomatic uh, carotid artery stenosis indicates there are a lot of recommendations published in 2011. And you see that according to this study, carotid and arterectomy is still preferred and carotid stenting is indicated in high grain stenosis when the stenosis is difficult to access surgically, when medical condition increases the risk for surgery for radiation-induced stenosis and for rest stenosis after and arterectomy. For asymptomatic carotid artery stenosis, recommendations are uh, very uh, limited for uh, carotid stenting and uh, carotid endarterectomy is preferred. 
One word regarding intratural stenosis, there was also a randomized trial, some priests comparing uh, stenting to medical management group, and you see that in terms of stroke and death after the treatment, outcome was better in the medical management group compared to stenting group. So actually, stenting is indicated for the treatment of intracranial stenosis in case of a new ischemic event under appropriate medical treatments of very limited indication. In conclusion, imaging, diagnostic, and interventional plays an important role in the management of acute ischemic stroke. It participates to the selection of patients for IV thrombolysis and also mechanical thrombectomy. It participates to the treatment with mechanical thrombectomy. It has a more limited place uh, for the prevention of stroke. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.